What do you do with all that trash you accumulate from your yard? In the spring, it's pruning. In the summer, it's grass clippings. And in the fall, it's leaves and garden trash. It doesn't just disappear with the trash truck that picks it up from your curb. It goes to the landfill, and it adds to a growing waste disposal problem. In the past, we've had the luxury of simply disposing of our solid waste in the local landfill. But many landfills have closed due to reaching capacity or being environmentally unsound. New, more stringent requirements for landfill siting and design mean fewer new landfills are opening. In the past 10 years, over 12,000 landfills have closed in the United States. During that time, only about 1,000 new landfills have opened. There are currently about 5,500 active landfills, but nearly 2,200 are expected to close within the next six years. It's clear that we have a problem, but if not corrected, you can expect your garbage collection fees to increase sharply. There is something you can do about the problem, though. Consider that nearly 20% of the solid waste that goes into the average landfill is comprised of yard waste like grass clippings, shrubbery prunings, and leaves. Actually, that amount of yard trash represents a yearly average. During the summer and fall, from 50 to 80% of the trash entering the landfill is comprised of yard waste. So what can you do? Try recycling your yard waste. Yard waste is easier to recycle than paper, glass, and aluminum because you can do the recycling in your own backyard. And by composting, you're not only making an active contribution to conserving our environment, you're generating a product that offers tremendous benefits to your landscape and garden. By recycling yard waste in your own backyard, you're helping your community. After all, your trash does not have to be collected, transported, and disposed of in a landfill. Hi, I'm Dave Williams. Thank you for joining me as we take a look at backyard composting. In this presentation, you'll be introduced to the science and practical side of composting, including how to build and maintain an active compost pile. You'll also see uses and benefits of compost, and I'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of some composting systems. As you know, in nature, if leaves or other organic material, that's anything composed of carbon compounds, actually anything that was at one time alive, is left alone, it will eventually rot. However, the practice of composting is a much more active process. The aim of composting is to reduce organic materials to a stable humus material. Ideally, this is done as quickly as possible, but the rate of composting is ultimately determined by the amount of yard waste you have to deal with and the amount of effort that you want to put forth. Air, moisture, composition of yard waste, and microorganisms are the ingredients for compost. The more closely these factors are maintained to the ideal, the faster the composting process takes place. To carefully manage these factors in the compost pile does require effort, but the results can be fully decomposed materials resulting in compost within a matter of weeks. However, even a less carefully managed pile can be quite active and yield a finished product in a few months. Let's consider each of these factors. Microorganisms of various kinds are the primary workers in the compost process. An active compost pile can contain thousands of species of bacteria and fungi. These organisms feed on the waste you put into the pile. Actually, they utilize the carbon provided by the waste. When they break down the carbon molecules, the microorganisms decompose the pile. As the pile decomposes, an array of beneficial macroorganisms grow and feed in the pile. Carrion beetles and earthworms are some of the participants in the later stages of decomposition. Microorganisms feed on carbon, but in order to grow and reproduce, they require some nitrogen. There needs to be a certain balance of carbon and nitrogen. This balance is known as the carbon to nitrogen ratio. The ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio is about 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Sawdust has a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio, something like 700 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Such a material provides lots of food, but not an adequate supply of nitrogen for microorganisms which depend on it for amino acids and proteins, which are essential building blocks for growth. The result of a pile of primarily woody or high carbon materials like sawdust, wood chips, or branches is a pile that decomposes very slowly. On the other hand, Materials with a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, such as fresh grass clippings, green leaves, or kitchen scraps, can cause microbial growth to increase so rapidly that oxygen is depleted in the pile and microorganisms die. A problem that accompanies such an anaerobic pile is a foul odor. 
So how do you get an ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio? There are some fancy ways to calculate exactly what needs to go into the pile, but what usually goes into the pile is what you have on hand at the time. One way to maintain an active compost pile is to add a cup of ammonium nitrate fertilizer or a couple of shovels full of manure per one half to one cubic yard of woody materials or leaves. On the other hand, if you're generating a lot of grass clippings or other fresh green materials, add a little bulk by mixing in some dry leaves or other woody materials on about an equal weight basis. As microorganisms feed and grow and populations increase, temperature within the pile increases. This further speeds the composting process to a point. The temperature in a typical backyard compost pile can reach about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Beyond that temperature, which is usually realized in the core of the pile, many organisms begin to die. Temperature drops and decomposition slows. Temperature will also drop when the food source has been used up and more materials are required. Ideally, temperature would be monitored and the pile turned and mixed to introduce new materials to the declining microorganisms. However, simply turning the pile from time to time as it settles and to introduce new yard waste usually maintains a fairly high level of microbial activity. While the rate of decomposition is slower, the amount of effort you have to expend is much less. The pile will cool, but will heat up again once populations rise. Turning and mixing a pile is necessary to provide adequate air. Microorganisms need air for metabolism. Without air, those organisms responsible for the fastest composting can't survive. The pile becomes anaerobic and odors can result. Excessive moisture can also cause anaerobic conditions in a pile. Even though moisture is essential for microbial survival, too much can be devastating. Ideal moisture level in the pile is about 50%. A tensiometer could be used to measure moisture, but a much more practical and cost-effective instrument for measuring moisture content is your hand. A handful of compost taken from within the pile should yield a drop or two of water when squeezed tightly in your hand. If the weather has been dry for a prolonged period, add some water to maintain microbial activity. You can hose down the compost pile directly, or you may be able to water your pile with the sprinkler when you water the lawn or garden. If the pile is too wet, turn it. In very wet conditions, if an objectionable odor is noticed, add some dry leaves, chopped branches, or sawdust when you turn the pile. Whatever you add to the pile will break down much more quickly if it has a smaller particle size. That's because the microorganisms can reach a greater surface area of the material to feed on. Shredding or chopping materials greatly speeds up decomposition, but it's not essential for successful composting. Many kitchen wastes are suitable for the compost pile. Eggshells, coffee grounds and filters, and vegetable kitchen scraps are fine